final example of the carnage a wolf pack could cause was the attack on convoy SC-7. The convoy of 34 ships had two sloops and a corvette for defence. On the 5th of October 1940, a lone U-boat spotted the convoy. After radioing for support, it sank two of the ships and then submerged. The escort stayed behind to pick up survivors. As the unprotected convoy sailed on, it met a line of six U-boats. The attack that followed caused carnage. Only 12 ships were to make port, and these were saved by the fact that the Wolf Pack had news of a larger convoy and had departed. But attacks wouldn't always go the U-boat's way. The familiar ping of sonar from an approaching ship would be followed by the explosions of depth charges. Another threat came from attacks from the air, whilst the U-boats were on the surface. Submariners were a breed apart. They were often at sea for up to 60 days. They operated in a cramped environment with little or no washing facilities. They took turns in cramped bunks, sharing space with torpedoes. But the well-trained crews were incredibly effective. At the end of 1940, Britain faced the real threat of being starved of supplies. However, improved detection techniques would start to turn the tide. The Kriegsmarine still had successes. In 1942, nearly 1,700 Allied ships were lost. The convoy system bringing merchantmen together with protection from warships was the basic defence against the wolf pack. If the Germans had been able to bring their large surface raiders, ships like the Bismarck, out into the Atlantic at the same time, uh, the relatively small warships that defended convoys would have no answer uh, to ships of that size. If they had ever been able to do that, they would have been able to pose a much greater threat 
uh, by simultaneously threatening the convoys with large ships, therefore the convoy would have to disperse, and with wolf packs, which would harry the dispersed ships. But they were never able to do that. But new airborne radar and more escort vessels meant the U-boat menace was all but over by 1943. As 1942 dawned, the war in Russia was stalled on most fronts. Since the launch of Barbarossa, the Wehrmacht had lost over a million troops killed, wounded or missing. And a further half a million could no longer fight due to disease or frostbite. No new offensive by all three army groups was possible. After the failure to take Moscow and to win the war in 1941, uh, which had seen the Soviets demonstrate for the first time that they could counterattack, given the additional help of the Russian winter. The Germans for 1942 still have a choice. They are not yet on the defensive. So they have a major choice to make. Do they attack again, and if so, where? And the argument for attacking towards Moscow is as strong as ever, and a German plan to do so is drawn up called Operation Kremlin, uh, which leads to the Soviets' concentrating forces to defend Moscow itself. Uh, but, but Kremlin is a deception plan. The Germans are in fact planning to attack elsewhere. Hitler's new plan was for Army Group South to sweep through the Caucasus and ultimately to the oil fields of the Middle East. With the great grain-growing regions of the Ukraine, Hitler believed that the oil of the Caucasus would give the Third Reich what it so desperately needed, economic stability and the chance of surviving not just a long war, but surviving successfully in peacetime as a viable state. So the main assault is made in the South. Despite objections from his staff, Hitler resolutely refused to consider the fact that the army was badly supplied and under strength. In order to protect the left flank of the thrust, the city of Stalingrad would have to be captured or destroyed. The capture of the city, named after Stalin, would also be a major psychological boost to flagging German morale. But Stalingrad would prove to be a major turning point in World War II. The operation was called Blau and would involve a million men, 65 German divisions and 25 from Hungary, Romania, and Italy. It began on the 28th of June 1942 with a blitzkrieg attack. On the 6th of July, the attack had stalled as the Russian defenders fought back. But Army Group South pushed forwards. By the 23rd of August, the 6th Army under General Friedrich Pallas launched an attack from its bridgehead over the river Don. They initially met little resistance, but as they came within sight of the city, artillery fire stopped them dead. They soon realized that the artillery batteries were manned by Russian civilians, women factory workers from the city. They would become the first casualties of the battle for Stalingrad. The following night, after the panzers had reached the suburbs of the city, the Luftwaffe launched a massive bomber raid. The fires lit up the night sky, Nearly 40,000 people were 